what do we think to ourselves when we when we see that Putin saying these things about leaking American secrets and the conditions for which I think he's keeping his options open. There's, been a, <laughs> there's a conversation that occurred between him and the Obama administration, and and uh, he's going to play this however he wants to play it. He probably hasn't decided exactly what he's going to do, and this buys him a little bit of time with the U.S. administration. As a matter of fact, it appears that if Snowden did what WikiLeaks had done in the past, the documents which he intends to leak are already out of his right. possession and on foreign servers that cannot be easily accessed by anyone. Is extradition a real possibility in Russia? It's uh, not as a legal matter. We don't have an extradition treaty, but the Russians can give him to us whenever they want. Uh, so it's a purely political decision in this case, given, as it often is with Russia. So it's, if it's purely political, given what we know about the U.S. and Russia relations lately, they've been a little... Yeah, they're very tense. And frosty. And, and uh, I think Putin will not do it to just be kind to the Obama administration. He's not going to do them a favor. But uh, it may become just a headache for him. I mean, to have this guy living in a transit lounge in Sheremetyevo Airport may just be too much of a distraction. At some point, they may just throw him out. So let's move on to an aspect of the Snowden case that involves uh, a lot more tension at the moment, which is what the EU has said in the wake of the publication over the weekend in Der Spiegel that, uh, that Americans, the NSA and perhaps other agencies had been spying on uh, EU member countries including in their uh, embassies here in the United States. Yeah, this is a very damaging leak. In some ways, this is more damaging than the leak of that we were hacking back into the Chinese uh, systems. These are our closest allies in the world, and they have very high standards, at least at the European level, about data protection. The European Union institutions are excluded from national security operations themselves. So while the member states do it, the European Union institutions don't do it. So for them, it seems very unfair and, and kind of bad form uh, to be hacking into it. The but the fact is, there are governments do this to one another. It just it's part of international relations. So how does the United States, the White House, do damage control on this and reassure the Europeans that this is just normal procedure? What they do is they go to the national leaders through the intelligence services. So the, the CIA and our other uh, national security agencies have very close relationships with their counterparts in these foreign governments who report up to the respective heads of state. And in that dial, in that channel... There's so many of them. There are 28 nations now in the well, European Only Union. a few of them really matter for this one. There's a the handful of big countries. The UK is already on our side. You know, David Cameron's not saying anything about this. Sure. Uh, so you come into the national level. So the outrage that we hear from people like French President Francois Hollande is just for show? I mean, he knows, for example, that the Americans are spying on French does. installations here. I mean, he can presume that they're spying on French installations here in the United States, but what about uh, some of their outposts overseas? Of course he knows that the he spying knows. goes, of course he does, He's fine with they that. Do, and if they could do it, they'd do it too. I mean, it's part of international relations, but he has to say this for domestic political consumption. Face. You can't be silent and say, yeah, it's okay that they're stealing our secrets. You have to so show behind the scenes, outrage. nothing's going to happen. Well, I think the, where the price will be paid is by, against U.S. firms that do business in Europe. Hmm. So it's one thing when hmm. the intelligence service directly targets an institution of state. It's another thing when it's, in fact, a U.S flag telecommunications provider or cloud computing provider who's servicing the entire European right. continent. That is where I think the pressure and the pain will be felt as a consequence of these disclosures. But you mentioned that Europe is one of our closest allies, if not the closest. What is the potential for damage to that relationship? Uh, the, the, I mean, the damage, it will be somewhat damaged, but not so much by, at the, on the key national security issues. It will, it will be damaged more on the trade front and on telecommunications policy. So the European Union institutions have the capacity to regulate their own telecommunications space. They don't control national security operations. So the European Union, the European Parliament and Commission can enact measures, regulatory measures, that make it harder for U.S. businesses to do business in those sectors in Europe. You mentioned trade also. So you buy this idea that the European Union-U.S. trade deal that is under discussion right now could be threatened? Yeah, well, it may be delayed a little while. It's not like this is moving particularly quickly in any case. I mean, these trade deals take forever take to negotiate. And in the, the timing is extremely awkward, so they may put it off a month or two before they start. Richard, another issue that has no bearing on the Snowden case, but which is certainly happening on the periphery of Europe, uh, is the protest movement gathering pace again in Egypt. Over the weekend, we all watched hundreds of thousands of people gather in Tahrir Square and elsewhere in Cairo to protest uh, the government of Mohamed Morsi. How seriously do we take these protests relative 
to the Arab Spring three and a half years ago? Uh, it's very serious. Because in that case, the Arab Spring was protesting against autocratic governments that had no real democratic mandate. In this case, Morsi, despite his autocratic tendencies in the last year, does in fact have a strong electoral mandate. So it's an entirely different matter when someone takes the street to try to depose someone who's democratically elected because they don't like his behavior in office versus someone who is not. Uh, yeah, and as Eric mentioned, the military, sort of we've been waiting for a response from the military now issuing a 48 hour ultimatum. What does that say it, to you? It's very complicated and unclear how this, the military to date has not shown a willingness to use violent force to have bloodshed against its own people demonstrating. And so if they're really serious when they make a threat like that, they have to be prepared to follow through on it. And even if the, these protesters were satisfied and they say deposed Mohamed Morsi, the president, which has happened in the past, that's called a coup d'etat, then there's going to be another group of protesters who back Morsi from the Muslim Brotherhood who will take the streets and violence will be required then. Richard, do you have any idea what the military means when it says that if at the end of 48 hours the protesters in the Morsi government don't have some kind of an agreement, that the military will offer its own roadmap? I, I, I do not. And I think that is an important question, and I have a hunch they do not either. Meaning this, the, the Egyptian constitutional process has been underway for three years now. The military has played a key role into it, and there still is no roadmap. So the idea that in 48 hours you can come up with a roadmap that you haven't been able to do for multiple years is not credible. Do, does the U.S. government see the Egyptian military as a force of stability? Yes. Uh, and in fact, we give them a lot of money. It's over a billion dollars a year of uh, military aid that goes back to the Camp David Accords in 1979. It's been going on forever. It's a very close relationship. They are a source of stability, the last one in that country. Also true in, in many other countries like Turkey, for example. Yeah, but so what does this say about the democratic movement? I mean, Morsi was democratically elected. Right. And then uh, in gov he had an opportunity to establish himself as a democratic leader, but he showed increasingly autocratic tendencies and took over unilaterally many of the organs of state that weren't really given to him by any sort of legislative process. So what you see here now is a predominantly secular democratic movement against a democratically elected president. Does it say anything, Richard, that uh, oil prices, for example, which were a, a big barometer of the tensions in the Middle East during the Arab Spring, aren't really moving that much? Yeah, not in this case. Egypt is not an exporter uh, of, uh, and of oil, and it doesn't look like this is going to have a lot of contagion into other regions. The big question in the Arab Spring was, would the uh, protest shifts into the oil-producing states in the Gulf, and it did not. The only one where it was a significant problem Bahrain. was Bahrain, where it was snuffed out by a Saudi invasion. So until you see evidence that the protest movement shifts to those Arab governments, the ex oil exporting ones, you won't and see And for now, this seems very much confined to, to Egypt. To Egypt, yeah. Yeah, but no question, we remember when Egypt sort of set off a chain reaction in the rest of the region. Yeah, that's right. And, and in fact, the Saudi watching. government was one of the Mubarak's closest friends, who's now locked up behind... Uh, By the way, these are, these are live pictures of, of Egypt. And uh, wh while we understand that, uh, you know, there, there aren't as many people out now as there were on the weekend, you can see many, many thousands gathered at the moment in Tahrir Square. Yeah, now, this is a he unbelievable show of uh, numbers in the streets of Cairo. And one of the more memorable images over the weekend was the burning of the Muslim Brother Brotherhood actual headquarters. headquarters. Yeah. yeah, the opposition just growing. That's no, and it shows you the two factions inside the inside this country. One of which is is secular, and the other uh, uh, partly Islamist, uh, and backing Morsi. And this is the this is the fault line uh, in the country. The military is predominantly secular organization. It's not uh, an Islamist organization. So, at what point then does the United States or Israel, for instance, have to at least say something, acknowledge, or intervene in some way? The, I mean, Israel keeps doesn't say much and just watches its border along in Gaza and uh, in the Sinai. The the United United States has to, is going to say very little and be very diplomatic. They've been burned once. They've lived through the Arab Springs. They sort of survived that, but not with great distinction. And in this case, they will be very careful to stay out of this one uh, and not get too active into it.